Here is, based on US data, kind of a snapshot of the incomplete revolution looked at from what demographers would like to look at, or family demographers would like to look at. Now, first, there's the activity rate of mothers. And I compare 1960, you could call that kind of the climax of the Becker era model of the family, the nuclear family, highly specialized, the housewife model, uh, where the activity rate of low and high educated women was just about the same, very low. Now, look at 2000, uh, 40 years later, uh, the big gap between high and low educated women, huge. And that is consistently what we're finding in all the data, that the big divide is not so much between women and men, it's between low educated women and high educated women, or between traditional women and the new woman. The revolution was started basically by the daughters of the bourgeoisie, the daughters of the privileged classes, uh, and we're going to get into that, that started obtaining education, started investing in higher education in particular. As a result of that, one of the standard indicators that demographers use is that the age of motherhood, or first births, starts getting postponed, the postponement syndrome, we call it. Uh, and that we can see happening among higher educated women, not among lower educated women. Lower educated women continue to have children exactly like they did in the old Becker equilibrium era. Look at divorce rates. Or unstable marriages is another way of, of talking about it. Uh, they, it used to be that there was not much difference in the propensity to divorce or unstable partnerships in the good old days. They tend to be very stable. The Parsonian family was a pretty stable entity. But as a, as a correlate of the female revolution, families became more and more unstable. But surprisingly, the instability was not among the vanguard of the revolution. The instability is among the women left behind in the revolution. And then there's a single mother, uh, or single parent, but 90% are single mothers, uh, that has also been a, a correlate of female revolution. It is, of course, also very much related to, but not exclusively, <coughs> to divorce or separation. Now, again, the syndrome is very concentrated among lower educated women. And it's getting more and more so. Here is one of the greatest sources of demographic polarization that we have today in, it, in the advanced societies. The single mom phenomenon is almost exclusively becoming a low educated woman feature. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out how could we come to grips with this. Uh, those of you here who know demor demor demographic literature are familiar with the concept of the second demographic transition where demographers, especially Van de Ka and Les Tag, have built a theoretical kind of veneer on top of the concept, arguing about postmodern or post-materialist values are driving our new behavior. Uh, I, I don't buy that for a second. Um, I think what is happening here is uh, the, the closest I can come to it in terms of getting a theoretical model on where we are today is some kind of multi-equilibrium scenario. And I think Scandinavia is going to show us what is the ideal type emerging new equilibrium, which is a, uh, couples that are relatively stable, increasingly stable, but not as stable as they were in the good old Becker equilibrium. Doesn't really matter. They recombine. Uh, with relatively high fertility, they want the two children and they tend to get them. Both of them have a career, both of them have the idea of a lifelong commitment to employment and a meaningful life and economic autonomy. This, I think, is becoming the dominant one, uh, but it has difficulty emerging. Uh, and this is where then I come to my unstable equilibrium, which is, I think, the dominant equilibrium right now in Southern Europe, it is still quite present in Scandinavia, but is, is declining rapidly. Uh, and it's also quite present in the US. It, it, it's full of pathologies. And that's, I think, the best indicator of the fact that we have an unstable equilibrium. Namely, it is producing suboptimalities, 
both in terms of the micro world of families and in terms of the macro world of society. <coughs> Let me illustrate that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> First of all, low, uh, low fertility, the child gap, is pretty much the consequence of the inability of people to combine their desires. That is what demographic research now is showing very clearly. That the new research, the research on fertility, basically it's showing that the big key here is, is motherhood compatible with a lifelong commitment to work? Most women now want to work and they want a lifelong commitment to work. They want economic autonomy and these women can't have children. Or it's difficult for them to have them. They can have them in Scandinavia, they can't have them in Southern Europe. But they have them very, very late. They wait until all the pieces of the life puzzle are placed before they can start having children. Have a stable contract. Have also the partner, preferably, also has a stable contract. Have a job that's flexible enough so that they can allow themselves to have the, these couple of kids. Have access to childcare. All these standard elements of reconciliation dilemmas that we are so familiar with have all to be in place. If they're not in place, then you have suboptimalities, and that is in terms of fertility evident. And I think the best, my best indicator of uh, unstable equilibrium is low fertility. Now, what's interesting, what's emerging is very interesting, is who are the people in Scandinavia who have fewest children, or who are the women who have fewest children, and who are the ones who have most? The most fertile women are college-educated, women or university educated women working in the public sector uh, and the lowest fertility is among lower educated women. They've reversed the logic. Once upon a time it used to be totally reversed. High educated women didn't want the children because uh, they you know, got in the way of the careers. Low educated women were the ones who were pumping up the, the total fertility rates. In Scandinavia now it's just exactly the other way. I, I, I thought I could get away without mentioning the welfare state once, but here it comes. I think the women's revolution has to be completed for us to move towards a, a, a dominant, more dominance of the new equilibrium. The more people move towards the dominant equilibrium, in multi-equilibrium theory, the more you will also have incentives to move. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy element of, of multi-equilibrium. And move out of the unstable kind of equilibrium that is producing suboptimal family results. How to get out of that? I think the welfare state has to accelerate. 